Hello, everybody. I'm Alexandra. As I was just introduced, and I probably know a lot of you because I go to school here every day. Um, but I'm excited to talk to you today about innovation, which is definitely not something I talk about in the hallways every day. Um, but today I want to talk about how we perceive innovation usually, um, my journey as an innovator, and how we can change how we think about innovation to become a little more uh, unique in our everyday lives. So I think the kind of innovation economy that we live in today started in 1984 when Steve Jobs launched the Mac. And when he did that, he kind of made technology pretty sexy and pretty cool for the first time in a long time. And people understood that technology wasn't just something for science labs and research universities, it was something that was gonna come into our everyday lives. And that definitely continued in 1990, when the World Wide Web was first connected, and when people got on the internet and they found that they could collaborate with people all around the world to start solving problems um, and changing the world in big ways and in small ways too. In 1991, when the clicker works, <laughs> There we go. Linux, the first open source software, was open to the world. And that's when, really, people saw that technology was something that anybody could use, um, whether you had a PhD in computer science or not. And people started seeing technology as a way to solve problems and change the world and change the future. So that was even before most of us were born. And those were some pretty exciting times. And the world started to see technology, computers, iPhones as the way forward. but. I personally think that that came as a cost to the future of innovation because it established some pretty big myths about innovation that kind of stifle creativity. So the first myth is that innovators are all Californian computer science geniuses. And I know that I certainly am not one of those and I have never, you know, um, shared a dorm room with another middle-aged, mid-twenties man who was a computer science and physics genius. Um, but that's not where all innovators come from. But somehow we've been trained to think that innovators have this special unicorn breed of human that we can only aspire to be, um, but it's not, it's some gene that people are born with and that we can only aspire to be them. But that's definitely not the truth. Uh, the truth is that, you know, there are so many paths you can follow to being an innovator and being innovative. Innovation, in my mind, is just solving a problem in a new way, and there's no one way to solve a problem. That's definitely something I've learned at Branksome. Um, and you can you know, be solving a problem with your Lego blocks at four years old and finding a new way to construct the car package they've given you into a plane, or you can be 90 years old in a nursing home and change the way you live your daily life, and those are both ways to be innovative without, you know, being a PhD Caltech grad who can understand deep computing better than anybody else. Specifically, my truth is that when I started thinking of myself as an innovator, I was 15 years old. I'm, I still think I'm young now when I'm 17. I was a girl. Uh, I still am. <laughs> two, two things that are typically underrepresented in innovation in science and technology. Um, I didn't have a roommate who was, my only roommate is my cat, who was um, a genius along with me. I don't know how to code. I never did. I hope to know how someday, but that wasn't my background. And I didn't have some wad of cash waiting in my 15-year-old bank account to help me start a business. So I came from an atypical background. Um, but the reality is that when you're an innovator with an atypical background, there are so many supports out there waiting for you in the world that are trying to help like everybody from any sort of background be innovative. And that's what you have to take advantage of in the world today. So I started at one of these ecosystems waiting to support young entrepreneurs called CHAD. And CHAD is a Canadian charity, and it's a month-long program that happens at universities all across the country every summer. And I went into CHAD thinking that I was going to come home after two days. I didn't actually book a flight home because I thought I would be scared away by the science nerds, um, which I didn't think of myself as. But when I got to CHAD, I actually found a group of incredibly like-minded people who were really enthusiastic to solve big problems in the world. And Chad was the first time that I realized that you can come from any background and start it with a problem and work towards solving it. So at Chad, the challenge we were given was to get Canadians outside. And my 
group. We didn't, we didn't build an app. We didn't have any insane technology. We just started a subscription box company that gave you all the tools you needed for an outdoor adventure um, every month. And it wasn't, I mean, it, ultimately our company venture was successful. We worked with Parks Canada and Uber and lots of big corporations, but it wasn't because we had any business, business knowledge coming out of grade 10 or grade 11. It was because we were all enthusiastic and we were ready to work together and support each other. And what I found there is that one of the key things about being innovative is finding people who support your crazy ideas, who think that when you say something that sounds impossible, they're excited to work with you to find a way to do that. So having that group of people around you is a really important part of working to solve challenging problems. The summer after SHAD, I went to a program called Catapult. And Catapult is an incubator for high school students. Again, lots of high school support out there for everybody who still goes to Ransom. Um, and you spend three weekends in three different cities working on building a company. And I came into Catapult with a problem. I saw that having two parents who are doctors, I've been exposed to lots of medical problems. So I came up with a medical problem that teens aren't really engaged in healthcare. I saw my rowing carpool on the way back to school Googling their symptoms and diagnosing themselves with various cancers and deadly infections, just all on the drive back from Argos to Branksome. And I thought, this is not the way the world should be. There are so many resources out there to help young people engage with and activate and empower themselves to manage their health. I want to connect people to those. So I came in with that problem. Another group, I mean, equally valid, came in with a desire to build a shoe website for teens. And we took two very different paths. You know, they wanted to build their website. They worked along that path, and you know, they, they built the website. But I came in with this big, scary problem, knowing I was going to fail, because I can't help every teen out there to be empowered to manage their health. Um, but it's having those big ideas and being open to fail that allow you to ultimately weed out the little bad ideas and the impossible things until you find something that actually works. So at Catapult, they encouraged us to you know, build things and fail fast. And I, I mean, I started Emoji Health, which I'll talk about more in a second, just by texting my friends. And I mean, even they were my friends, but they were telling me, this is failing. I, I'm bored by what you're doing. Um, and you know, then I moved over to Facebook Messenger, and it was a little bit better because I could send more visuals. And it's getting those you know, feedback from people you know, from people you don't know, finding ways that you're succeeding and you're failing, um, and by challenging yourself to not be afraid to fail, that you can start solving problems. And so ultimately, um, what came out of Catapult was Emoji Health, and Emoji Health has been quite successful. I'm surprised and excited by it every day. We are a company that earns revenue, and I have employees, and um, it's all very exciting, and I've presented on big stages at conferences like South by Southwest, and I've had lots of opportunities because of Emoji Health. Um, but when you know, I first came out of Catapult, I didn't think it would ever be like that because I'm 17 years old, and I would never think that being 17 years old would uh, be an asset in being a founder of a startup. But what I've realized is that you know what you know, and you have to embrace what you know. I know what it's like to be a teenager, and so when I go into a business meeting with a round table full of pharma-like executives, I certainly don't know what they know about pharma, but I do know about being a 17-year-old girl, and they do not know what it's like to be a 17-year-old girl. And they know that they don't know what it's like to be a 17-year-old girl, because when they try to reach out to people like me, they fail. Um, and so they're pretty excited that I have that experience and that I can share that with them, because that's a unique skill set that not many people have. So that kind of leads me into why I've been so excited what I've, about what I've done with Emoji Health. It's really inspired me to think about the future and what the future is going to be like. I've realized that the future must be created by youth and by us and by high school students and by not waiting until you have letters behind your name, like an MD or a law degree or an undergrad degree even, to start building the future you want to see. Because young people are people who are going to be living in the future for longer than anybody else, and we have to create the future we want. Um, it's going to be pretty cool when you see even technologies like I mean, growing organs or looking at your mood on your watch. That's really cool. But it's also really cool when my friend Layla starts a granola business and everybody in our grade starts buying granola and eating granola in class. And that's super cool and fun as well. It doesn't have to be technology. It doesn't have to be anything super special. It's just 
re being ready to solve problems and do things that excite you. And that's what's gonna build the really cool, exciting future we all wanna live in. So what we have to remember that is that the future is now. I mean, the future, the, when I started this presentation was now, and you know, you're, so I keep thinking about the imminent future, and the future is you. So don't wait until someday when you think you're gonna solve this problem that you know you're gonna have, you can start now. And you have different problems now than you're gonna have in 20 years. And the way you're gonna solve those problems is gonna evolve, but you have to take advantage of what you can do now to change you know, your life, your day, your community, or even the world. So before I conclude, I just wanna start with the three keys I think there are to being innovative. And I mean, before you can even do these three things, it's important to remember that it doesn't have to be the Steve Jobs, HP, shared garage, white middle-aged man to be innovative. You have to start with just knowing that you are an innovator even when you just solve the problem of how do I run to the AWC fastest on chicken shawarma bowl day. You have to figure out those small things. Um, but it's important to have a purpose and know that what you're doing is valuable. I am excited to wake up every day and work on Emoji Health because I know what I'm doing is changing people's lives and I know that what I'm doing has value. And when you find something that you're passionate about, you're gonna work infinite many times harder on it because when you're excited to spend the Saturday that you don't have homework working on a company, that's pretty cool. And that means that you know that you're invested in what you're doing and people can appreciate that. People will respect you for that and they'll help you because they know that you want to do what you're doing. Being authentic is also super important. Knowing who you are, what you're good at and what you're not good at is so important. You can't go out and try and convince people that you are an expert in healthcare knowledge when you're a high school student. I don't try and do that. I embrace what I know and what I don't know and I, people will respect what you know and they'll value you for that. But you can also work with other people who know things you don't know and when you build cohesive teams that can help each other to know things and not know things, that's really important. And most importantly, you have to be brave. If you can do everything else, if you can create the next Apple even, but you don't have the confidence to do it, you're never gonna get anywhere. So you have to have the confidence in yourself and your idea and the world to support you in that before you can do anything. So I think you know when you do those things and you're brave enough to believe in yourself as an innovator, even when you can't really see yourself as an innovator yet, that's really important. So thank you very much. It was very exciting to speak to all of you. Thank you.